Hi, everybody. My title has more, um, more words in it than I've got minutes, so we'll move quickly. Um, words are important, and, and I wanted to use a couple of definitions. We are talking about affiliations, and the title should be Affiliations for Dummies. The stuff on the left, that's important, but not as important and the return of when we talk about affiliations. This is a parent-subsidiary type of structure. You've seen it a lot. Parent organization shares control and autonomy. If you're the organization that's thinking about joining this structure, you come in based on the belief that you're going to get something from it, and you're going to give something up to get it. Um, it gives, as I mentioned, a high level of autonomy, um, and there's some sharing of control. That's in contrast to a model called a merger. And typically, um, a merger is something that's designed by one corporation. I'm ahead of my slides, which is unusual. <clears throat> The merger is designed as a, as a single entity. You may bump into it. Um, it's so, somewhat daunting for organizations because as we go in, we know that we're going to be subsumed by the larger organization, or at least that's what our fear is. The reality may be something different. And frequently, as we begin to think about joining a larger organization, we realize that maybe we're the small fish in a larger pond. Had a recent example where the organization that, that joined got two board members to the larger organization. After about three years, the board member for the smaller organization became the board chair of the larger organization. So kind of a hostile takeover, uh, if you will. Either one of these structures or approaches work, but it's not really what's important. But when we think about affiliation and merger, I thought the definitions were important to get out. Deciding to merge is the easiest decision a board and aging services in the nonprofit world can make. Because typically the way it's happened is we shoot our hand up when we have two days of cash left and a payroll coming due. So all of the myths and misconceptions that we hear about are because of, of those surrenders or those failures. Um, a merger doesn't have to be for the weak and infirm. And in fact, um, today it's happening more frequently with the strong and moderately strong organizations. We sometimes make the assumption that organizations of the same denomination or religion should get together easier. Well, there's a reason that three Presbyterian organizations existed in Philadelphia for more than 100 years. It was politics and it was history. It's more important to focus on values than theology. And lastly, affiliation doesn't mean loss of control, identity, um, and culture. And yet we think it does because I go back to the former slide, which is the only time we've seen most affiliations happen in our field is when somebody's having to give up. So if we skip that, we take it off the list, why would people think about an affiliation? They think about it because it adds depth, it adds access to resources, it may help us grow, it may give us um, access to capital, and there's some really exciting things happening in that regard. You can look out there and say, what makes the difference between a successful affiliation and an unsuccessful one? The successful ones appreciate the fact that there's an emotion in this decision. This is not a purely business decision driven by the attorneys, although it frequently becomes that way. And the unsuccessful affiliations are organizations who think that the only rationale for it is we're going to save a lot of money. If we have nothing other than saving money, we're better off trying something else because it's not going to be a successful or viable affiliation. The truth is that bad affiliations in our field rarely happen because somewhere along the line we've stopped and said, if my objective's not being served, I'm not going to move forward. The ones that we think of as bad affiliations are when people have failed and when the rescues have happened. So when's the right time? If in your planning and your discussions you're thinking you've ever had a conversation that, you know, at some point we might want to think about affiliation, then the right time is right now. Because you'll never have more leverage and power. And that comes from being able to walk away. How do you build success into affiliation? Know what your objectives are. Know what you're looking for. Know what you want to avoid and what you're not willing to give up. Without that, we go down a lot of different roads in terms of structure and otherwise. Chemistry is important. People don't want to talk about this, but if we're in a room with people and we don't like them, that affiliation is not going to go very far. But if we're in a room with people that we like, we trust them, that's got the potential to go down the road because eventually we'll, we'll work things out. Find the North Star. What's the compelling reason for the affiliation? And our North Star may be different than our potential partner's North Star, and that's okay as long as we both acknowledge what they are. And lastly, form should follow function. The lawyers should only get involved at the end, once we've decided what we want to do and how we want to accomplish it. Too often, affiliations are driven by the attorneys, and I am one, 
They're driven by attorneys, and we spend all of our time talking about structure and boards and so forth, and we have no idea of what we're actually being formed for and what North Star we're, we're looking to, to create. Thank you.